for his love, his grace, and his mercy that he has bestowed upon all of us. Believe me when I tell you that God is a good God, isn't he? Yes, yes he is. He's a wonderful. He's worthy uh, of all our praises. And we thank him for his son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross uh, for the remission of sin. We are so blessed and we are so honored. We are tickled to death. We are running over with joy. On, and we are just so, <laughs> so blessed. Uh, to be in Austin, Texas tonight. Oh, yeah. Amen. Yeah. God bless you. We certainly want to thank um, Reverend um, John Jackson uh, for his warm, wonderful hospitality. Uh, since we got off the plane yesterday in Dallas, Texas, uh, John has been taking care of us. And I want him to know that we really appreciate that. You know I mean? He's done a marvelous job in uh, making sure that we are where we're supposed to be at and uh, make sure that we're eating good food. Today I had some Texas you, uh, uh, barbecue and Texas <laughs> beef brisket. You know? I don't feel like too much talking tonight. You know, It's a bad thing to feed a preacher before we have to preach. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and the next thing on all of you want to sleep. So you don't want to, you don't want to preach. You don't want to feed them, Gary. <laughs> but um, we certainly um, thank God for um, we have a Dr. John Jackson. John is a special gift from God to all of us. You know, he's so humble. He didn't really <clears throat> tell you all that he does, but he serves as the co-chairman of the American Clergyship Conference around the country. He, he's doing a great job in that uh, capacity. <clears throat> We're so delighted to have um, <laughs> uh, Gary Abrahams, <laughs> yeah. a wonderful spirit, yeah. uh, coming from Nashville, no, from Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, he's also been a blessing in this province and has worked with uh, Sub-Region 4. Uh, he's been really a blessing in that. And uh, to Ken Morgan, um, I said to him, uh, Ken, I'm coming. He didn't believe that. I think he called um, Gary a couple times and said, I heard he got fired. <laughs> I didn't get fired. No, no. <laughs> no, no. It really I got pushed up. But, um, but I told him I was coming. I said, if we don't do anything, we need to get down to Austin. You know, and to, to fellowship, and so we are grateful, and we're just grateful for all the work uh, that Kyle Peterson have done yeah. in Austin, yeah. Texas, yeah. have done in this church. I mean, she is certainly a, a wonderful spirit. When I first met her on the Zoom call, uh, she was just a firecracker. She was just going. <laughs> I had to stop her. I said, wait a minute, we're we on this for like one hour. You can, you can take the whole hour from me. <laughs> just say hello. And so um, Kyle, and Mother Kyle, is just so gracious, and she wanted to make sure um, that um, Pastor Sawyer and I connected. So let me thank you for opening the doors of your church. But more importantly than that, open the doors of your heart That's right. uh, to allow these strange people that you really don't know uh, to come inside your church and to work together as children of God. I mean, Amen. that's really big of you. And thank you for that. You really do. And I can only tell you that you're going to get blessed while you work with this movement. It's a great movement. I've been um, probably with them since 1986. I've been with them for a long time. And um, i got to tell you, I've been so blessed. Uh, my life has been enriched. Uh, my ministry has been blessed. My life has been blessed, you know, right? <laughs> so, so I'm just a blessed man. <laughs> if, if I don't get another blessing, I got enough blessings already to praise God for. All right, so this is here's what we're going to do. <clears throat> um, we're going to get a little informal, and I'm going to move this podium out of the way. So, yeah. And I'm going to sit down. Because y'all sitting, I'm going to be sitting too. Yeah. And we're going to have this little talk. Is that all right? Yes. Yeah, that's what we're going to do. <clears throat> Yes, we're going to have uh, just a little talk and just want to share with you on why um, we are um, down here. I am representing, a, as um, Reverend Jackson has said, an organization um, called the American Clergy Leadership Conference. And really it's not an organization, it's a movement. Yeah. And it's a movement to build the kingdom of God here on earth. It's a movement to bring us all together, That's true. Uh, regardless of our color, regardless of our race, uh, regardless of our religion, 
of our um, educational background. If you look around this room, you'll see people of diverse natures. Around this um, church tonight, you know, some from Japan, some from wherever you are, you from there. <laughs> and, uh, and that's amazing. It's amazing because this is the work of the American Story Leadership Conference to bring us together and to help um, to create that community of love and peace uh, that Jesus talks about. Mm -hmm. Remember when Jesus says um, in the scriptures, those who read the Bible, he says, I pray that they might be one. one right. Yeah, one. One in spirit, one in heart, uh, because Jesus understood the power of oneness. When you're able to, to work together as one voice, as one people, and pulling in the same direction to uh, create a goal that is centered upon God, uh, you can go. But whenever we are divided and, and we're pulling in different directions, God cannot work on that foundation. And so what we have in our country, and we are so clear about this, is the American Leadership Conference is to uh, restore the family, That's right. to uh, rebuild the community, and to renew the nation. Now let's go back uh, to the family, to restore the family. The first institution that God created was not United Airlines well, or Delta, <laughs> but the first institution that God created was what? The family, right. And he created that according to the scriptures in Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2. He created male and female, right? Male and female, that means man and woman. Just two species, just two genders, male and female. He created the, according to the scripture, he created the, them in his image and in his likeness. Now think about That's this for right. a moment. That's it's very important said. because what's happening in our world, mm. particularly in our country, is uh, an abomination to the plan of God. And maybe that's why we are suffering you know, through the atmosphere in this 104 degree weather, uh, because God is not pleased. I mean, I understand the last three weeks, you've been over 100 degrees. You know, the whole world is bipolar. And maybe because God is not pleased with what we are doing, you know. The family is the moral schoolhouse of our community. John just said a few moments ago, you know. But what would happen if John was not in the house? Then that kid would have got away with beating up his mama. And guess what? I've seen time and time and care again where children not only talk back to their mothers, but they beat up their mamas right. and, and say, I wish you were dead, and that kind of foolishness. Mm -hmm. And so I am totally convinced that this is not a physical issue, That's right. uh, but this is a spiritual is issue. Mm -hmm. Satan has run amok mm -hmm. in our communities, in our home. He's trying to destroy the home. Now they're saying is that a home can be made up of two men can make a home and two women can make a home. That's not of God. That's of the devil. Because he made male and female. And you put two of the same genders together, the only thing you're going to have is a whole lot of rubbing where you're not going to have any children. And God understood the design that he made. And so, brothers and sisters, the family is under serious attack. And while the family is under attack, the real question is, what are the people of God doing about this? Now, we are in our churches, and that's why my wife and I are working so hard. We're in our churches, we have our own religions. But did you not know that Jesus did not come for a religion? Right. He did not come for a denomination, yeah. but he came for a people. That's right. He came for God's children who have became disconnected from God and lost their lineage. He came to restore that lineage and Amen. bring them back to God. That's right.
And so Satan knows that, so he's destroying the family. So while we're in our different denominations, you are over here, and I'm over there, and we're arguing about water baptism. We're arguing about the way that we serve the communion, right? <laughs> and some say, well, the way you should be baptized, we should take some water and sprinkle it on you, you know? Others say, we should put you down in the water. And so we're fighting. Uh, over religious foolishness, not understanding that we all are brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. I am not your enemy, and you are not my enemy. Because Paul said it very best. I said it yesterday in Oklahoma. I need to say it tonight. Paul said this, we wrestle not That's against right. flesh and blood, but against principalities against rulers of the darkness, mm. against spiritual wickedness, watch this, in high places. Therefore I say unto you, put on the whole armor of God, that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, and having them all to stand, having your lawn girded about with truth, and the helmet of salvation. So what's Paul trying to say? Paul is trying to say this, that we need to stop the foolishness and work together as God's children. We gotta tell you, once we get to the kingdom, God's not gonna say, Well, you are a good preacher. <laughs> He's gonna say, Well, you are a good unificationist, or were well, you a good Baptist, or were well, you a good Catholic. He's not gonna say that. He's gonna say, I was hungry, but you fed me not. I was naked and you clothed me knock. I was outdoors and you didn't give me a place to stay. And then at that day, they're going to say, Lord, when were you hungry? When were you naked? When were you outdoors? And Jesus said, when you have done it to the least of my little ones, that you have done it unto me. Which really means that every face is the face of God. And we should never walk by each other or to look down on each other unless we are willing to pick each other up and to help each other. And I must tell you, I can't do that by myself. And John can't do that by himself, you know. And, and you cannot do that in this beautiful church. I love your, your, um, the name of your church, New Wine Ministry. Now you open up the door that you don't understand you open up. You don't have to go. You talk about new wine. That means you are ready for a ready. new level mm -hmm. that God is trying to take That's you to. Right. You ready for some spiritual change, man? Because our churches are dying. They are dying. You know, we have divorce in our churches, segregation in our churches. We have single parents in our churches. And while the preacher is preaching, they are going to hell. But new wine said that I can give them a new message because these young people don't care nothing about Moses and the Red Sea. They don't care nothing, they care nothing about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire of the furnace. They care nothing about that. The only thing they want to know is how can I live a better life? How can I live a God-centered life that they really don't understand? A God-centered life where I'm tired of going through the same problems Every day, every year, I have four or five boyfriends, I got four or five children, I want to break that cycle. And guess what? The truth of that is inside of you. You have the answer to it. The question is, are you godly enough? Do you have the courage to stand up for God and to declare the glory of God and to declare the truth of God? Because believe me this, God do not care how well you float going down the stream. God want to know, can you buck the tide? Can you stand the tide? That, that, that's what it is. So it's easy to follow the crowd when they are praising your name. But can you follow the crowd when you're standing on truth? I had this marvelous opportunity when I met my wife to sit down with a man uh, that was so falsely accused so lied on, so mistreated, the world didn't understand him, but not realize 
a year a message to change the world. I sat down with him in Seoul, Korea. I sat down with him in his home in Las Vegas, in a small home in the living room. There was 12 ministers, and we had to sit on the floor uh, for seven hours and to hear him talk for seven hours. And you know the beautiful thing about that was the seven hours that he talked, and sometimes I thought he was rambling, but he was talking, but it was the best seven hour sermon that I ever heard. And we sat there and um, listening and just sobered it in his last days. And uh, he looked at my wife and said, you know, you are a black woman. You color, right? And so we were scared. <laughs> and, and, and we were scared to move. Now, this, he, yeah, here's this 90 something year old guy scaring us big preachers, you know? So I said to myself, I'm going to get on the back of this wall. And I'm going to stay here. And I'm not going to move till Jesus comes back. <laughs> I'm not going to move, man. And so he, he was talking, and he was just talking the truth and pouring out his heart. Then he looked at me. And he says, you, you, back there, on the back of the wall. I thought, oh my God, here it comes. He said, you are the youngest person in this room, aren't you? Now, I didn't know whether I was the youngest or not. But I said, yeah, I'm the youngest, I'm the young, I'm the youngest one in here. And he said, you dumb, aren't you? Yeah, I'm dumb too. <laughs> he didn't say that, though. But he said, uh, are you hungry? Yeah, I'm very hungry. He said, let's eat. And we ate together. It was amazing. Not long it was the Last Supper. And then he goes on after you eat. He said, now, let's go fishing. And I'm saying, let's go to bed. He said, let's go fishing. And we went fishing. But this man changed my life, changed my ministry, changed my perspective. There are those who don't understand him today, and they lie on him, and they say that he's in a cult, but he's not. And his name is Sun Young Moon one of God's best prophets sent to the world to change the world. Amen. If you only will listen to him. He talks about this thing called marriage and marriage blessing. Listen to him, a little snippet of what he says. It's beautiful. He said to, to me and he said to all of us there, he said, when you come into this blessing, so understand this, that when you look at your wife, she is not a woman. Then I'm saying, well, what is she? She's not a woman, what is she? If she's not a woman, I don't want her. He said, no, she's not a woman. She is the daughter of God. Yeah. I said, wow, that's deep, man. And then he said, and you are not a man or a husband. You are the son of God. And that's deep. Because if she is the daughter of God, that means I have to treat her with a high level of respectability, and I must be responsible. And most importantly, I must not hurt God's daughter. Yeah. You have children? <clears throat> How many got daughters? All right. Everybody. Now, <laughs> men, how would you feel? You better look out. Yeah, see, I'm coming, John. Be careful now. I'm coming, John. I got to come, John. I got to come. <laughs> but how would you feel if someone mistreated oh. your daughter? I don't care how saved and sanctified <laughs> Holy Ghost feel, the fire back down. Hey, glory. Y'all talking in tongue? That means nothing. The only thing you see is this hurt mind. Child. She ain't my child. So therefore you don't go and revenge your daughter. Yeah, that's right. So I learned that I have to treat my wife right. Regardless of how she treat me. Sometimes she has an attitude. Sometimes she don't want to talk, and sometimes she walk away, and sometimes she uh, close the door and go downstairs to the basement. I got to ignore all of that. I got to treat her right, John. I got to treat her like she's God's daughter. And once I do that, guess what? I reap the blessings of God. And I got to say, I have never been so blessed now that I ever have been. 
I'm more blessed now. I go where I want, do what I want, say what I want, buy what I want, because I'm blessed. I'm blessed to be here with you tonight. Now, what happens when she mistreats me? I don't go back and want to hit her and slap her. No, that's God's daughter. You know who God is, don't you? The one who stepped out on nothing and for nothing went to a place called nowhere and so he got to a place called somewhere, got a hold of something and brought something back from somewhere to nowhere and hung something on nothing and told nothing to hold it until I tell it to do something else. Her father is God. So when she acts up, I'm going to tell her father. Yeah. Lord, you see, you see how she acted, don't you? You see how she carried on? But then God deals with that. That's not my place. That's what Brother Moon taught me. You know, and that was just so, there's so many other wonderful things that he taught us. And um, we have benefited from it uh, by studying this. And we have benefited from the blessing. And one more point I want to say, and then I'm going to be quiet. He told us that, you know, when you do get married, that you must come together, make a commitment to each other, no uh, divorce, no separation, to raise your children God-centered, husband and wife, God on the top, but it must be God-centered that you may have godly children. You must do this. So therefore, he told us that when we come together in holy matrimony and have our marriages blessed, after we get blessed in marriage, now this is going to really shock you, he goes on to say that you must abstain from consummating your marriage for a minimum of 40 days. That's crazy, isn't it? Because once you get married, it's honeymoon time. And the honey must stay on the moon. It can't be on the moon. So it's honeymoon time. You know, it's time to get it on. You know? So what do you mean separate for 40 days? No. <laughs> you separate for 40 days. <laughs> Not me, man. But no, he said you got to separate that. Because those 40 days belong to God and belong to your spouse. How many days did Jesus spend in the wilderness? Forty days. Yeah. Why was he there? To be tempted of Satan. And he overcame Satan through those ten, three temptations. But there's a struggle in that wilderness. And in those 40 days, there's a struggle. But if you hold on, God will bless you. And you will eat of the fruit of the land. And final remark that I'm going to close out. It's not enough to love God. Not enough. You have to love God and love your neighbor. <clears throat> love God. And, love, and you can't do one without the other. Because even the Apostle Paul said this, how can you love me who you have never seen and hate your brother who you see what? Every day. He said you're a liar and the truth is not in you. I want to thank you for listening to me. I want to thank you for allowing me to be in this Austin church tonight. And I want to thank you for your wonderful hospitality, and God bless you. At this time, let us hear from the life of wife, Reverend Zena Sainz. Okay. <laughs> Isn't he handsome? Yes. Praise the Lord. Yeah. I get to see the face of God every morning when I wake up. <laughs> cool. I just have to look at my husband. Amen? Amen. And I'm hoping all the ladies feel that way, too. <clears throat> with your spouse. And when the men look at you, your husbands look at your wife in the morning. Working on it. You see the daughter of God, <laughs> the face of God. Amen. My husband covered a lot. Is there any questions before I continue? I know we're at 7.30, two. <laughs> Poor thing. Well, I want to thank you for putting your names in my prayer book, my own book of life um, in Revelations. There's a prayer bowl for prayers, and thank you for filling it out. If you haven't, please come see me after, because um, I pray on it, all the names in here, and I have from what dates to what dates. What my husband said is true, and it can happen to you. The blessing, when he was talking about a man 
telling him he was single. I was in the same room. They only yeah. chose 12 ministers in America at that time. Mm -hmm. And they chose me from Hawaii, a little girl from a little island. <laughs> so I was ordained in our church in Hawaii. And I sat on the floor. And I didn't know this black man in the, <laughs> that who sat on the back wall. Mm -hmm. And this prophet that we were listening to pointed to me, and I was hoping he would not call on me. You know how you hide from, you know. In, in the front row? I, I, was, I wasn't in the front row either. I was like in the other corner. And I said, oh, golly, please don't call on me. And he, he said something like, white ministers, stand up. So all the white ministers stood up. And he said, all of you white ministers, Liars, you must repent, sit down. And then, and then this wise man said to us, oh, black ministers, stand up. And all the black ministers who was black stood up. And they said, black ministers, you must forgive the white ministers, <laughs> sit down. And I'm from Hawaii. I didn't stand up. I was like, I, I don't, I'm, I'm brown, I think. I'm chocolate or brown, I'm not sure. So, so I just kind of sat there and just kind of hid. And this prophet points to me and say, he said to me, woman, why are you not standing up? And I kind of just went like this. I couldn't even say a word. And all the elders, all the other black and white ministers who knew my father, because he was first generation American clergy leadership conference, ACLC, who was a pastor, my father. So they knew my father and they looked at me and they were very fatherly. They said, oh, oh, she's from Hawaii. That's why she doesn't stand up for white or black. She's in the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> <laughs> and this wise man said, woman, you are black. And I'm sing I was single at the time. And I thought to myself, why is this prophet telling me I'm black? Am I going to have black babies? Am I going to marry an African? Am I going to Africa? What, you know, at what's going to happen? Not knowing that, that at the back of the room, uh, the man that I didn't even know <laughs> that was hungry and said he was the youngest one there. It took about three years later that the same man I would be blessed in marriage with. Amen? That is a miracle, right? It's not a coincidence. It's a confirmation. Yeah. Amen. That somehow a little girl from Hawaii w was to marry a man from the city, New Jersey, all the way on the East Coast, to come together and come and talk to all of you beautiful people today. Amen. What's yeah. the odds? I can probably go around this room and, and go around and everyone say your name and where you're from, born and raised. Let's go. <laughs> You know, because we represent all parts of the world, right? What's the odds on all of us coming together tonight? Mm, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. It's not a coincidence. Yeah. It's a confirmation yeah. Yeah. that we have work to do with each other. Yeah. I've got your names, your numbers, your address, your email, mm -hmm. so that we can connect the dots together. Yeah. Yes. That we need you. God needs you right. in the kingdom. We need you to get elevated into the blessing to springboard your ministries, to springboard your families, so your children can see what the blessing is. Because it's biblical, right? Abraham blessed Isaac, Isaac blessed Jacob, Jacob blessed Joseph, so on, all the way to Jesus, right? And now Jesus is coming back and telling us we need to receive a blessing. Right? And Jesus showed us we need to wait 40 days. 
Traditional Christian marriages is not working. Married one day, and that night they consummate. It's not working. Can I get an amen? amen. It's not working. There's a lot of divorces out there. Amen. This is the best investment of marriage. I've looked all over the world for the best marriage investment. And that's what took me so long to get married. Because if I had any doubt, I would not marry somebody. I had to make sure God said to marry this person, right? So three days before my husband asked me to marry him, I was praying. The Lord said, if a man named Reverend Sykes asks you to marry him, you say yes. <laughs> three days later, I went to an airport, and the man who picked me up was a man named Reverend Sykes. <laughs> and we were blessed in marriage two weeks later without him seeing my elbows or my knees. He didn't know what I look like, where I come from, but something told him to ask my hand in marriage. In total purity, like you said, fidelity, with, with no touching, no kissing, no nothing. Amen. Nothing, zero. And this is what we're teaching the young people. You're not gonna try on the shoe before you buy it. <laughs> right? Nobody wants to eat from a dirty spoon. Yeah. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Jesus never dated. Why are we allowing our children to date? Why is that allowed? Because we see it on television, we see it in commercials, we see it, it's desensitized now. Right? I had, I had a niece called me up at 18 years old and said, Auntie, can I come and live at your house? I said, sure. Okay, can my boyfriend come too? I said, no, but you can call uncle and talk to him about that. She never called back. <laughs> because all the other uncles and aunties are letting them do that go to their house with their boyfriend and stay overnight without a ring, um, without commitment, without a blessing of marriage centered on God. Mm -hmm. So therefore, for my husband and I, we had the blessing ceremony. We waited 40 days like Noah did. God washed the world clean for 40 days and 40 nights to create a new garden of Eden. Noah did. He, that was the only righteous man there that God could find. And Jesus did. Therefore, we ought to. And this is a very big sacrifice. So my husband and I did that. 40 days. Just working out all the junk. We all have got baggage. Right? You know the baggage that comes with marriage, amen? The stuff. You know what it is. I don't need to know. But it takes 40 days of praying together every day, scriptures. When we bless couples, I send them a scripture, text them a scripture and a word from the prophet who started all of this up, who told me I'm black <laughs> before I got married. And I, I get scriptures and readings every day for 40 days so that they're reading Bible and praying together instead of consummating at night. And then after the 40 days, there's a three-day ceremony between your couple and God. It's because you can welcome God into your marriage again. Reboot your computer, your marriage computer. Reset. Amen. Because there's a lot of stuff that goes on, especially what I call the legitimate wife. The legitimate wife. If pastors, you can teach this to the ladies, the legitimate wife. For instance, Jacob left his homeland, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Got married to who? Leah. Yeah. And then seven years later, got married to Rachel. Rachel, right? And then whoever else, or whatever else happened. Uh, so now you've got children from the first wife, you've got children from the second wife, and you've got children from maybe some other persons. Oh. And this is what's going on in the communities. And the legitimate wife doesn't know what to do. Because the legitimate wife is saying, oh my gosh, 
He has babies from first person, second person, third person, fourth person, fifth person, and now we've got all these children. And the women sometimes end up hating each other and passing on that seed of hate to the children. And then the children are angry at each other and they don't get along, like Ishmael and Isaac. Amen? And that's what's happening today. There's an Ishmael tribe and an Isaac tribe and they all don't get along. But it's happening today, right? Exponentially, a lot. In every family, you probably know someone like that, has babies by one, two, three, four different women, right? But the legitimate wife, you have a position. I know sometimes it's hurtful, it's painful, right? Because you have to accept all these children from your man, and because it's his children. And you have to get over that hump, because now you have to have a mother's heart, like our sister right here. She loved everybody as her own, yeah. right? Yeah. No matter what color, creed, religion, everybody, she has a mother's heart. Yeah. No matter what you do or say to her, she's gonna keep coming back to your church. Yeah. <laughs> she's gonna keep going to her car and grab more food or grab more something, right? She's gonna keep coming back. Even if you fire her and tell her not to come back, she's gonna keep coming back, right? Who can fire a mother? Nobody, right? You're never fired. It's lifetime job, like Supreme Court justice. Nobody can fire you, amen? It's like this lady right here. So the legitimate wife is the key the blessing and the legitimate wife has to take that stand and love all those children and love all those women that come with it. Can you do this? <laughs> that is why our world is what it is today. The women, we have a really big part to play. We have to be the legitimate wife that have legitimate motherly love to not only the concubines, but their children. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. That is why the kingdom couldn't come to Jacob and Esau. Even if they come, the men will come, the men will fight one day, come together and have a happy time the next day. Men are easy, right? Men are easy. Women, we're tough, <laughs> right? We have a hard time forgetting, we have a hard time forgiving, we have a hard time letting go. We're like a broken computer that keeps having bad memories coming back, and we keep bringing it up, <laughs> right? Right? Is it, is it, you hear me? So that is my ministry to tell the ladies, because the men, my husband takes care of the men. For me, I tell the ladies, love like a mother, no matter what. You love all the kids the same. There's no special, everybody is a VIP. Everybody is a very important person to God and he sent us legitimate wives to lead the other ladies. Amen, can I get amen? I hope you never heard this before. Did you ever hear this before? No. no. New Wine Ministries, amen. God bless you, we love you, and aloha.